God is good, and today, whoo, praise Jesus. I thank God for the rain. It means I don't have to spend as much money on water. Glory to God to, to uh, water my dead lawn. <laughs> I'm really not used, to, uh, not used to, to brown grass unless you just don't water it, but there's seasons here in Texas, so it's, so it's been interesting for us to get used to it. And I pulled out of the driveway the other day, and I was so excited to see a patch of green grass and then I realized it was only because a pile of leaves had covered it and uh, I guess was creating a warm spot for it to grow. But um, always good to see the green grass. I, I, I guess I got ahead of myself and said, I guess uh, winter is almost over. And somebody corrected me and said, no, we, we got like another month or two. And I was like, well, one can hope. <laughs> you know, it depends on what you're looking at, right? I mean, I, I see in my, in my mind, in my eye, I see green grass. That's a good thing. Y'all want to look at brown grass, and you do whatever you want, but I'm going to look at the green grass. Even if it's one blade, that's hope for me. Glory to God. Open up your Bibles, if you would, to uh, 1 Kings chapter 13. I'm going to give a little bit of uh, background on chapter four, uh, from chapter 12 as we head into chapter 13. Today I want to share with you the tale of two paths. The tale of two paths is, the, is what I titled it today. Sometimes I'm just a meat and potatoes guy, man. I just call it like it is, you know. I started thinking a tale, that's kind of like a fairy tale, isn't it? No, that fairy tale is different. A tale is a story. It can have factual things or it can be something made up. This is a factual tale. Amen? So we're in, in 1 Kings chapter 12. The Israelites appeal to uh, Rehoboam uh, to ease the tax burden placed on them by his father Solomon. And Rehoboam... Uh, takes advice from his friends of his youth rather than the elders uh, <laughs> that he should have been going to. And I think sometimes, you know, we get with our friends and, and as I was younger and I was like, man, you guys do not know what you're talking about, right? I mean, if I wanted to find out how to do something, how to get through something, I always, want, I always went to grandpa. I love going to grandpa. Grandpa just went through stuff. And there was wisdom in his, in his life. There was wisdom from the things he experienced. But here we see Roboam, he's going to his friends rather than going to the Israelites. And so basically what happened is he wound up instituting what his friends had told him. And the Israelites decided to go home and leave there. And then the Israelites began to, um, they made Jeroboam their king, who had previously fled Egypt for the scheme, uh, because he was scheming to become king and he got caught. And, uh, and so he left. So he was already up to no good. How many of you know there's just people out there just up to no good, right? I mean, I think that's why we need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit so we can determine when someone has uh, ill intentions, we might say. Amen? So Jeroboam continued to live in Shechem and uh, fortify the area against any attacks. He was afraid that the Israelites were going to uh, eventually turn on him and set up allegiance with Rehoboam. And Jeroboam makes a really bad move, and he takes a pair of golden calves, and he takes two calves, and he puts one golden calf in Bethel and one in Dan. And we know that that was kind of an old style of worship in a way that the Israelites had uh, set up those, their own idols. And so he was setting up two things. Why did he set up two places, uh, uh, two temples in his territory? It's because he didn't want them to go back to back to. Uh, Israel where the uh, original temple was. He wanted to keep them there so that they didn't wind up uh, giving, uh, giving homage to Rehoboam and living under his, uh, under his reign. So Jeroboam, one of the things he also does is he winds up making priests out of men that were never ever supposed to be priests. He didn't call upon the Levites. He held festivals on jays of his own choosing and he makes unholy sacrifices to the golden calves that he sets up. So that's what happens in verse 12 to lead us up to, to uh, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 12 to lead up to chapter 13. Now, one of the things I want to tell, share with you is that none of this stuff escapes God's eye. How many of you know that there's nothing we do that escapes God's eye, right? It's funny how much people think they're going to hide something from God. It's like, God's got a, he's got a face too. I believe it. I don't know if you believe it, but I believe God's got a face when I'm doing something and I think, oh, he ain't looking. And he's like, right? You ever gotten that feel from the Holy Spirit where he's going, what you up to now? What are you doing now? You know? 
In 1 Kings uh, chapter 13, I'm going to start with verse 1 and we're going to go through verse 10 to start with. It says, And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. How did he go? Did he go on his own? He went by the word of the Lord, right? And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. So he was getting ready to burn incense to his cows. Then he, the man that was sent by God, cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, O altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar <clears throat> shall split apart, and the ashes on it will be poured out. So it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God who cried out against the altar in Bethel, he stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Arrest him. Then his hand, which he stretched out toward him, withered so that he could not pull it back to himself. The altar was split. <coughs> Excuse me. The altar was split apart, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. When the king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. And so the Son of Man, uh, the, the Man of God, entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him and became uh, as before. Then the king said to the Man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. But the Man of God said to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was commanded me by the, Lord of, uh, by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the same way you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. So there are actually two stories of two separate men being told here, each with decisions on the paths and directions that they were going to take. They, they like all of us, right? They have decisions to make about the paths that they're going to take. So they'll either take the path that God has established and set for them, or they'll take their own. And we know what happens when we establish our own path rather than taking the one that the Lord's established for us. And it, we find it in Scripture in Proverbs chapter uh, 14, verse 12. It says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but... Man, I'm telling you, wherever you see but in your Bible... You need to highlight that thing and circle it. It's, it's an important place. Same with therefores. I like therefores too. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Now we know that the ways of man are not right. We know that the ways of man tend to turn to, towards evil. They might even start out with good intentions. I don't know, I heard an old saying a long time ago that says, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But I think everybody sets out to do the right thing, but giving over to the voice of the enemy, doing what they think is right in their own mind, in their own way, it will lead to death. And here's the challenge. It doesn't just lead those people to death. It will generally lead other people to death who are following them. It be a family, it be a church, it be a, a, a group of, of worshipers. It doesn't matter. There is an opportunity. It's so important for us as the body of Christ to be able to look at our leaders and not Look at them and worship them. Man, I, I so go, go as far as I can to make sure that people in our church and people that come to know me, that it ain't all about me. I might be called to a position, a role, a place. Uh, I have a calling and a purpose, and I've sacrificed a lot. It says in Scripture that those who are called to the higher calling are the ones that are greater, uh, greater servants. And so I'm not all that in a bag of chips. And I don't, if I ever see somebody come and start going, oh, pastor, you're so amazing, you're so wonderful. I said, you just need to stop because you're just trying to tickle my ear and you're trying to give me, you know, you're trying to suck up and I don't like it. You just need to stop. I, I'm just not, that's not what I'm about. We need to, and I will always, in everything that we do as a church, I will never, ever say, oh, look what I've done. I always want to point back to what he's done. Because without him and without us going in the way he's called us to, we won't see the things accomplished that need to be accomplished. Amen? But then there's a way that's his way, and we have scriptures that 
a line and show us that too. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6. One of my favorite scriptures. Because I can't tell you how many times I've had to call upon this scripture when I don't understand God's ways because His ways are higher than our ways, right? His ways are not our ways. But everybody tries to make His ways. Oh, come on, God. I think you ought to do it this way. And God's like, well, I don't think so. Nice try. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Does it say trust the Lord just a little weeny, teeny weeny bit? Just a smidgen, a little pinch? Trust Him just a little bit? No, it says trust Him with your whole heart. Man, can I tell you that the body of Christ has a hard time grabbing a hold of this. Because the things of the world come at you, the things of the world, the, the enemy will even threaten you. Threaten you with death, threaten you with losing your home, your children, your wife. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. He will threaten you. And we, Christians get to this place where they, they, the, the, the enemy comes at them or their own mind, their own mindset gets them. It says, and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Oh man, I, can't tell, I can tell you, there are times that I wanted to go my own way. I just wanted to get ahead of God. Have you ever felt like you wanted to get ahead of God? You ain't moving fast enough. I mean, come on, when I look at Hebrews chapter 11, all I see is men of faith who actually didn't even get to see the thing that God called them to. But we're such a microwave, Burger King, you know, a bunch of people. We want to see God when he calls us to something, tells us to do something, tells us what's going to happen. We think the tree ought to grow right now. We think the little, the little seedling that we put on the ground, it's like you stand there waiting for it. Well, it's been five minutes. God, what are you doing? See, we have a thing where we want to see it. We have to see it today. But I believe that God, he puts things in us where we may never, ever see. Can we work like that? Can we serve God like that? That we're, When he tells us to do something, even we, if we don't see the thing evidenced in our lifetime, that we can believe and have a heart for the next generation that you're going to benefit from this. I know what's happening with our future generation right now is they're being saddled with a debt. They're being saddled with a debt. I pray, Jesus, I don't even know how God would do it, but I pray that my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren don't ever have to be saddled and hold on to this debt. See, that's the future that man is giving to my children. But I want to lay up an inheritance for my children. Right? Doesn't the scripture say that? Lay up an inheritance for your children? Now, my mama and papa, they didn't leave an inheritance for me. My granddaddy and my grandma, they didn't leave an inheritance for their children. But I was determined and destined, I don't know how God's going to do it, but I'm going to leave an inheritance for my children. But not just one that is physical, I'm going to leave one that's spiritual, because that's going to last a whole lot longer. That's going to, amen, brother, forever and ever, right? Because this world, man, what does this world have to offer? Not a whole lot. Psalms 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord as he delights in his way. And then Psalm 25, 10 says, All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Man, you don't want to go your way. You do. You want to go God's way because it'll go. Look, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I know when God called us out here, it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy. We have to every day determine no, God, we know that you have a plan, even if we don't see it in this, gen in this generation, if I, even if I don't see it in my own life, in my own lifetime. I'm believing, God, you're doing something big in this community. You called me here for a purpose. You did not move me 1,800 miles for you not to accomplish something. But I'm not going to get my eyes fixed on that. i got to see the little seedling happening within the first five minutes of my, of my arrival. Now, King Jeroboam and this man of God from Judah shows us some things that play out between God's sovereignty and human choices. I always say God's way, Yahweh, is the only way. Forget man's way. Forget my way. It needs to take the highway and get out of town. How many of you, like, face-planted when you did it your way? Hold on, I'm, I'm, I'm going to raise both hands. Whenever I've set out to do something, right, because... I, I tend to be that type A to the 10th power that's got to get do things. Okay, God said, and I'm, I want to get going, man. You said it, let's just make it happen. And we got to wait for God. We cannot get ahead of him. So it starts out with Jeroboam, that he's standing at the altar that he had built. He built it for a feast that he created to a God that he made up in a place that he chose. 
This man's in a really bad place, and he doesn't seem to even realize it. How do people know they're deceived? They don't. They don't. And when you go and try to tell them, bro, sis, you're deceived. You are blinded by whatever light it is you're looking at. It's blinding you. You are not seeing the forest for the trees. You are not seeing the train coming, and it's going choo-choo, and it's about to take you out. Pieces of you are going to go everywhere. Jeroboam's in a really bad place, and here he is, this man of God comes in, and he's like, whoa, what are you doing? And all of a sudden, Jeroboam, standing there at his altar, preparing to burn incense to the God, the golden calves that he's created, and the man of God brings a word. And the word speaks against the things that Jeroboam's doing at this altar. And you know what? I think there's times that people do things that they think they're doing them in the best interest of God, and they're really not in God's best interest at all. They think they're doing something for God, and actually what they're doing is actually against Him. He thinks he's doing a good thing, kind of bringing the people to have a place to worship. But they're worshiping the wrong things. And I think that's one of the challenges. Is God is not okay with us, number one, setting up a, a, a way that we're going to worship. I think that's interesting when God, people try to tell God how we're going to do things. It's like, what, are you crazy? He's the one that created all this stuff. We need to be following his way. But here's the bigger challenge. Jeroboam, he's leading people. Now, I think God takes that seriously. Before I became a pastor, that was one of the biggest things. I said, Lord, I don't know if I can be a pastor. I mean, I want to make sure that I teach and train the people correctly and rightly and biblically, biblically sound. And so it held me back because I, I, it was serious to me because I figured if there's going to be people who are going to be following my leadership, I certainly don't want to lead them down the primrose path. I don't want to take them down into a place where the, it's desolate and, and God's like unpleased. Amen? Now, there are a couple things to note here in this area of Scripture. First, you cannot solely rely on a leader to lead you on a righteous path. You must, can I just re-emphasize that, even as a leader myself, you must rightly divide the things that they are telling you according to Scripture. The things that they're asking you to do, where they're asking you to go, everything must align with God's Word. His Word is the ultimate source. And there are leaders, unfortunately, that are telling people to go a certain way and do a certain thing, and it doesn't even line up with Scripture. Now, it was a while back, and I had a young man come to me, and he was talking to me about how he was being mentored. He says, man, I feel like all I was was a slave for two years. He came to our church, and all I was doing was just loving on him, encouraging encourage him. I wasn't trying to get him to come to the church. I was just praying for him. And he, kept, and he says, man, I've learned more in two weeks than I learned in two years in internship. And then he, as I began to, he, he wanted me to mentor him, and as I began to mentor him, he starts telling me, he goes, you know, one of the things that they used to bring all of us leaders, the pastor would bring all of, of us leaders together, and everyone would have to bring their own bottle of whiskey, and they would have whiskey tasting at his house. And I looked at, I looked at this young man, and I go, and how did that make you feel? He goes, there was something wrong with it. Did you still go? And he says, well, yeah, I was, I was part of the internship. See, we got, the, the thing we got to build is leaders that have the ability to say, uh, no, I don't think so. Right? Don't we need that? Yes. I, mean, we're I mean, there's people trying to tra train these young people to do what they say. Don't do as I do, do as I say. And do it quick. Man, I looked at that young man and I said, we're going to break through some stuff. I said, I won't be having you do that. <laughs> but I said, I'm going to tell you this. And this is what I sense from the Lord. The Lord's going to shut that church down. Because he's not going to let a leader lead like that. He's not going to continue to let a man lead young people down this road of unrighteousness and drunkenness. He's not going to do it. And lo and behold, within less than a year, that church was gone and so was the pastor. And nobody's heard from him. So that's what I tell people. That's right, I'm a leader. God's called me to be the pastor of this church and to be the shepherd, under shepherd of Jesus, but the shepherd of this church. And I've always said and I've always told people, you need to make sure you're hearing God for yourself. Don't look at me for a word. If a word comes, that's great. But you've got to be connected with the Father yourself. 
And there's a couple of things. I'm speaking about two things, the Logos word and the Rhema word. You've got to understand what those two things are. The Logos word and the Rhema word are the word of God, but the Logos word is the word of God recorded in the Bible, and the Rhema word is the thing that God speaks to a specific occasion. It's the things he's speaking to our hearts and telling us, but it's always got a line. The rhema word's always got a line with the logos word because God doesn't contradict himself. And that's why I've trained people. I don't want people leaning on me, holding on to me, looking to me for every answer. What should I do in this situation? What should I do in that situation? What does the Lord God say to you? I don't know. I don't hear him. Well, then you better go start fasting and praying and find out what he's saying to you because that's the problem we have now. What we have is a bunch of people that are coming looking for pastor because and then when the pastor falls and he has an affair with his secretary and all of a sudden he's gone and they're broken and they're like oh my god what are we going to do they fall apart they leave the church they go to another church and that man has now crushed this whole body and why were they looking to him like that to begin with they should have been looking at jesus the second thing to note in this area it is common for people who are set, set on their own path rather than God's path. It's easy for people, when they're hearing the thing, when they're on the wrong path and somebody calls it out and says, what are you doing, for them to get angry, for them to try to restrain you, to try to attack you, to try to belittle you, to try to shut you up as a son or daughter in God. See, they don't want to hear anything that goes against what they're doing. Come on, tell me I'm not, I'm lying. People that are in sin and they're set on doing what they want to do, when they are in pride and all they are is, is focused on the lust of their own flesh, tell me how easy it is to tell them about Jesus or to tell them that what they're doing isn't aligning with Scripture. The only ones who are open to that are the ones who are humble in spirit, teachable, and they're humble. That, those are the ones who will hear. That's how you can tell right off where somebody's at with their spirit because if they instantaneously rebel against you and put up this wall now we know we got to break through something now i don't resist them because you can't you can't change a man's mind you can't change another person's mind they have to choose it for themselves but i'll tell you what we're a praying church we're a praying family We'll fast and pray. If we see somebody that the enemy's trying to snatch, I am not afraid to call it out, and I'm certainly not afraid to start coming against the enemy because I'm going to do everything I can to prevent them from being snatched from the enemy or or snatched by the enemy. Amen? They don't want to hear it. But it's kind of similar to John the Baptist losing his head because of King Herod and his wife didn't like the fact that he was meddling in their affairs and he was calling that them out on their sin and so what happens there was a plot to take his head now see for us as believers none of that stuff should matter it shouldn't matter if we're going to wind up having somebody against us because i'd rather a christian be mad at me make some gesture to me and walk away from me than for them to go away and me never have confronted that thing because i pray that someday somewhere on the line of their sin as they continue on that a bell will ring inside of their head that says Oh, I was warned before, and how did I get here now? I'm eating with the pigs. People don't just eat with the pigs. It's a slow decline to get to a place where you're eating with the pigs. Sometimes we got to speak against behavior. But I don't believe in behavior modification in the church. I believe in transformation by the Spirit of the living God. Behavior modification does not work. Trying to tell somebody not to sin does not work. But telling them who they are in Christ and to live out that, yes, that works. Because what happens is it's not about a behavioral change, it's a lifestyle change. It's an internal change. It's a transformational change that happens within their lives. I I think it's crazy that some people, it's not even about what you're telling them that's going on in their lives or trying to help them. You could just be telling somebody about the plain gospel of Jesus Christ and they'll be angry with you because they just want to sin and do what they want to do. But our job is not to worry about what people are angry about or upset about when we're talking about Jesus. The thing we've got to do is in love constantly bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
to every single person we can. Amen? That's what we're supposed to do. It doesn't matter if they get mad at you. They're going to get mad at you. Unless they're broken at their bottom of their bell, and guess what? Everybody has a different bottom. Some people got to go way down. The older I've gotten, my barrel's shallow. Because once you've experienced life and you experience a relationship with Jesus and you walk with him, you realize, I don't want my barrel to be deep. I want it to be shallow. But there are people out there, folks, that their barrels are deep. And you want to call them up. You want to call them out. And they won't. They're just not deep. They're not far enough. They're not deep enough. But that's not our job to worry about what it's going to take. Our job is just to love them and tell them. And pray that one day they look up from the bottom of that barrel, whatever their bottom is, and go, I repent! (laughs) Isn't it funny how in the church nobody uses that word anymore? Repent. Nobody talks about hell. Man, come on, these are real things. When I have a face-to-face encounter with somebody who's demonized, I can tell you right away, we are dealing with a spirit realm that both includes angels from heaven and the demons from the enemy. I'm telling you, they exist. I've, I've experienced both sides of the tale, uh, of the situation. It's for real. Man, Christians are so afraid of the demonic. I'm like, why? Don't you know who your Jesus is? Oh, that's probably where the hiccup is. I remember this one time I was praying for this warlock. He was an actual warlock of a satanic church. How he wound up at our church, I don't know, but some friends brought him, some people from our church brought him, and we were praying for him, and me and the senior pastor, and I wasn't even, I think it was the assistant pastor at the time, and, and he came to the church, we were just praying for him. And all of a sudden, the Lord had me start coming against um, Freemasonry in his life, because it was hereditary, it would, had gone through his, his, his lineage, and started praying against it. All of a sudden, this thing looks up at me with an evil look and says, your dad died. And it was a fact. My dad had, stepdad had just died three days before. And I said, well, that's true. I said, but you must have missed the, the bulletin. What? When you're hearing another voice coming out of somebody's face, you're like, you know, you know something's up. And he goes, what? And I said, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. He saw Jesus, and Jesus told him where he was going. And this guy went, and just yelled. And as I was praying against this priest masonry, all of a sudden that thing reached out and pushed me up against the wall. And I, man, I, oh, uh-uh, uh-uh. And I went back in, held my ground, and started going after that thing. And that guy, that warlock, got set free in Jesus' name that day. But there are not enough Christians out there who've been taught to even focus on and deal with the demonic in people's lives. They're afraid of it. I'm like, what are you going to be afraid of? I mean, we've been called as believers. Oh man, I think I'm off my notes. We've been called as believers to lead people to Jesus Christ, to bring healing, but also to bring deliverance. We have the answer. But nobody wants to talk about it. There was a woman that was in a Vaughn's grocery store and she's all, she's behind me. How many items do you have in your cart? And she's like, ah. And I was like, dude, what is up? And all of a sudden I hear the Lord say, don't let the enemy, don't let the enemy attack her. Don't let him bug her like that. You have power in you. That's what's going on. The spirit in her is responding to the spirit in you. Don't let him do that. You have authority over her. I said, oh, that's right. Thank you, Lord, for telling me that. And I just stood there in the line. I said, in the name of Jesus. I didn't say it out loud. I said it under my breath, and I said, in the name of Jesus, I come against you, Spirit, in the name of Jesus, I command you to stop tormenting that woman. In Jesus' name. All of a sudden, I feel a tap on my shoulder. Do you ever get tapped on your shoulder, and you're like, (laughs) right? I get this tap on my shoulder, and I turn, and I see this woman's face completely change. Now she's got soft eyes. She looks at me, and she goes, sir, I am so sorry. I don't know what got into me. I just wanted to apologize. I said, you're good. Are you okay now? She goes, I I am. I'm really sorry. I said, it's all good. Everybody has a bad day. 
or a bad demon. But we have power and authority. But we don't want to talk about that in church. Ooh, that's an uncomfortable subject. We don't want to talk about demons. Why not? We talk about angels. Everybody loves putting angels on their, on their, over their, their fireplaces. And, oh, look at all the angels of God protecting me. No, they're figurines. But they won't give one ounce of, of attention to the fact that somehow, some way, a door got open and stuff starts stirring in their houses. And then they start looking at the angels. Oh, they're here to protect us. Amen. Well, all hell's breaking loose in your house. You start praying to those things on your, on your altar. They're idols. Yeah, you gotta, man, I'm telling you, I boot the devil out. Man, I start feeling stuff. Sense. I go, mm-mm, not in my house. Not today, Satan. Open the door and there are times I've had to blow the shofar. There was one night I was sitting in my house in the other in, in California and we, we could see out like 40 miles. And I could, and it was funny because I got this picture of, of like hordes on horses wanting me because I was headed into, an, headed into an area of my life where I was kicking up things and doing things for God and I just felt it. I literally grabbed my shofar. How many of you know what a shofar is? And I took my shofar, I, <laughs> and I stood on the edge of the property, and there's like homes down below. And I sat there and I blew that thing, that, that thing. I said, the Lord my God is my protector. You best find somewhere else to go. All of a sudden I see lights going on in homes below me. <laughs> but when you're a believer, you're not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed that I need Jesus Christ as my crutch. I'm not ashamed that I need the power of the Holy Spirit to come against the stuff that comes against me. I'm not ashamed that I, 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 I rely on the Father in heaven to provide for money. I'm not ashamed. Why, what, what do we have to be ashamed of? What, should we, what are we shirking away from? I'm, I have to tell you, I stand boldly saying, the Lord Jesus is my Savior. My Lord and my God, there is none like Him. Not just here, not just in this building, but out there. That's where they really need to hear it. Here, we're just preaching to the choir. We're going back to the basic rudimentary things over and over and over again so that everybody can get it and get it going in their lives. Here, we're all preaching to the choir, but out there, that's where the message has got to get. It's, we got to take what we're getting in here we got to take what we're getting in our personal time with Jesus, in our personal Bible time, and for goodness sakes, we got to get it out there. That was not even on my notes, so it must have been for somebody. somebody. So this chapter starts out where this man of God comes by the word of the Lord. And I don't think it's a bad thing to go by the word of the Lord. I think it's a good journey to follow. But before the king can say, don't interrupt me, I'm... The man of God cries out against the altar, and this prophecy is brief, it's precise, and it's succinct, and it was clearly expressed. And at that moment, Jeroboam is given a sign and an opportunity to repent. And in chapter, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, 3, verse 9, it shows us the opportunity the Lord gives everyone to repent. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is an opportunity for him to come to repentance, but is that what he did? No. Instead of repenting, the king lifted his hand against the man of God, and his hand dries up. And I love it when God comes to our defense, but I have to tell you, we're not always going to experience where God saves our lives. John the Baptist and all the apostles are examples of that. So when Christians get it in their mind that God's going to keep me safe all the time, well, that's not truth. God has promised you eternity. God has promised to be with you. He has promised to give you mercy and truth and grace. He's promised to give you direction and guidance and call and purpose. He's given you a lot of promises that he'll be there. there. He will not forsake you. He'll feed you, put clothes on your back. He'll cover you. But God doesn't say he's going to stop you from dying for the cause of Jesus Christ. See, I love the fact that our hope and our future is in him. It's in him. 
got quiet in here. <laughs> Pastor Rick, are you telling me I got to die? I don't know. Maybe. Are you afraid? If you're afraid, we got to change that. If you're afraid of dying for Jesus Christ, there's a problem. Because look, that means you don't understand what he did for you. Living in this world in Christ is filled, we're filled with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and that's a benefit to the world. But for us, as followers in Jesus, our gain to suffer or be martyred for Jesus Christ is our gain. Doesn't it say in Scripture that those who are martyred for, in Jesus Christ's name, are, they're blessed in heaven? It's almost like they get purple hearts when you come into heaven. You know, how many believe that St. Peter is the one at the gate? Oh, you mean another false doctrine? Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> Who's at the gate? Oh, man, I'm preaching to the right crowd. So instead of repenting, the king pleads for his hand to return to normal. Instead of repenting, going, oh, oops, I blew it. He goes to attack the man of God. And then when his hand gets all boogered up, he's like, please, please fix my hand, fix my hand. In verses 11 through 20, let's read that now. Is it, are you guys enjoying this? I was all jacked up to come and preach this morning. That, maybe that's why the enemy was trying to bring chaos this morning. I was just all excited about what God was saying. It says, Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their, fathers the, uh, their father the words which he had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, which way did he go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went, who came from Judah. And then he said to his sons, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he rode on it. And went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And then he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. And then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I cannot return with you, nor go in with you, neither can I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. <clears throat> For I have been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by going the way you came. He said to him, I too am a prophet. I too am a prophet, as you are. And the angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. And what does it say right after that? He was lying to him. Nobody's ever done that. So he went back with him and ate bread in the house and drank water. Oh, is there a lesson in there for us today? After experiencing victory with Jeroboam, where he stood up to Jeroboam and said, Nope, I'm on a mission. God's told me where to go, what direction to go. He's told me what I'm supposed to do, and this is what I'm not supposed to do, and I'm on a mission. And he had victory. He had victory. So he's probably feeling pretty good. And now he turned down the king because the king invited him to come to his house. He said, no. And now he's talking to a prophet, too. Now, I'm, I think that the prophet must have been moved in some way by what he heard. But he's calling upon him, trying to get him to come to his house. And so he invites him. And it was different than the direction God told him to go, but it was also against the thing that he instructed him to do. And the man of God lets him know the word that he got from the Lord and that he wasn't to deviate from it, he wasn't to drink in that place. And so the old pro prophet, he lies to him, right? And says, look, God's given me a whole new set of orders for you. The man of God had clear instructions. Associate with, with no one because that place is cursed. Why? Because they were worshiping false gods. They were worshiping idols. But instead of sticking to God's plan and turning, or, turning down Jeroboam, he lets down his guard and he disobeys God. And I think the point for us here is pretty clear. First, get a word from the Lord. The second is don't deviate from the word from the Lord. Thirdly, don't let somebody else convince you to de deviate from the word of the Lord that he's given you. Because whose fault is it if you deviate from a word that God gave you? 
Yours. Because you were given the word from the Lord. Now look, sometimes it might lead to death. I pray for people it doesn't to give them an opportunity. <clears throat> but i got to give you a, an encouragement here this morning that it's by God's grace under the blood of Jesus Christ that he gives us the ability to repent quickly. When we realize the state we're in, it's time to get out. But here's the thing. When somebody says to me, the Lord told me to, and it doesn't matter what it is. The Lord told me to, and put whatever you want there. And I hear the Lord tell me something totally and explicitly different. I, I generally won't tell them. I won't tell them what the Lord said. Unless the Lord specifically tells me, I want you to tell them what I told you. But most of the time, if the Lord tells me something different than they got, here's the thing. I don't tell them what the Lord told me that's differing. What I'll do is I'll say, can I just encourage you to go back to the Lord and fast and pray on that for a bit? Just get a confirming. How many of you know that God's okay with you asking for a confirmation of the direction he's given you? He's not angry with it. He's not going, oh gosh, seriously? Can you just like get it the first time? He, he's not doing that. Because God wants you to go in the direction he wants you to go more than your flesh wants to go, I can tell you that. And so it's okay to go to him and say, look, I just need a confirmation. I've actually laid fleeces out before God and said, look, I'm not, a, I'm not trying to avoid what you're telling me to do. I just absolutely need to make absolutely sure that it is you because I don't want to be out of your will. But I won't just go and tell people, oh, this is what God said. Look, if God gave you a word, it's your responsibility to get the right word, and it's your responsibility to carry it out. I'm not responsible for you in that manner. Because each one of us will not be able, to, none of you will be able to hang on to my coattails and get to heaven and go, well, Pastor Rick said, Pastor Rick led me on the primrose path. That man lied to me, that prophet too. He lied to me. You're not going to be able to point. God's going to say, what did I tell you to do? Where did I tell you to go? Come on, church. We got to be careful about what we hear from other people. We got to make it make sure, number one, that it's right with the word of God. Brother, we get the word or somebody else says it. But I'll tell you, when somebody gives me a prophecy, and I don't go hunting for prophecy. I don't go looking around going, oh, look, there's a prophet that's in town. Oh, I hope they see me. I hope they see me. I hope they pick, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. Because they're so busy with their lives that they can't just sit with the word in the presence of the Lord and go, Lord, what do you have for me today? How about we just get the prophetic word from the, from the Father to begin with? Look, I'm not against prophecy and I'm not against prophets. But what I'm challenged with is Christians going and pining after the prophet to give them direction on what they should do. Nine times out of ten, they don't like what they hear. Or if they get a word, they want to, take, they want to run right now instead of waiting on the Lord. I never go hunting for words, ever. Because I've realized that in my life, because I know him, he's, he's in me. I'm in him. We're one. If I need a word, if I need a direction, I don't need to get... Now, praise Jesus, I'm always glad when... When God uses somebody else and says, yeah, the Lord told me this, and it lines up with the word God got, because I'm going to tell you, that happens a lot. Where I know it's God because God's already been telling me, and God will send somebody to go, hey, by the way, and it lines directly up. And I go, confirmation. Usually happens about three times when something like that happens. I thought it was funny when God was telling us to come here. We hadn't told anybody. The only ones that knew were the family. And I was in the parking lot at a post office, and the phone rings, and my friend, a pastor from, from Florida, says, all right, where is God sending you, and when's he sending you? I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, man. I've lived in California my whole life. Yeah, yeah, whatever. He knew. See, how could he do that? Because he knew God's voice. It didn't matter what he knew about my life or me saying, oh, this is home. I'm not going anywhere. Where is he sending you, and when's he sending you? So I tell him, I go, man, I can't get anything over on you. But God told me to keep it quiet. And he says, yeah, but he told me directly, so I guess he wanted me to know. I said, okay, that's a good point. And then he says, your daughter's husband's going to come and help you start the church. I was like, well, that's not looking like it's evident because one daughter has a boyfriend who doesn't want to go, and the other one doesn't have a boyfriend. I mean, how's that going to work? He goes, it's not my job to interpret the word. It's only my job 
to give you the word that God tells me to give you. I'm like, okay, all right, that's, that's okay. But when somebody gets a word from the Lord, man, I do not tell them to deviate from it. But if I think it's off, if I don't, if I don't hear the Lord saying that, I will at least encourage them to go and fast and pray. And if they come back to me and say, no, it was definitely the Lord, I'm like, Phew. who am I? You got you to gotta stand before God on your own. All right, verse 21. Who man. Now it happened, as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, ate bread, and drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. So it was after he had eaten the bread and after he had drunk that he saddled the donkey for him, the prophet whom he had uh, brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met, on the, uh, met him on the road and killed him. And his corpse was thrown into the, onto the road and the donkey stood by it. The lion also stood by the corpse, just standing there. Didn't eat the guy, just stood there, guarding the, <laughs> guarding the dead body. And there, there's men that passed by and saw the corpse thrown on the ground and the lion standing by the corpse. And then they went and told, uh, told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And now when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard it, and he said, it is the man of God who is disobedient to the word of the Lord. Come on, this guy's like, he's, he's like, convinces him, lies to him to go, go over here, go where he's at, and then gets a word from the Lord, a real word from the Lord, and spouts that out, and then is like, well, you bad little man of God. You didn't obey him. And then he starts telling him, oh, he was disobedient. Come on, tell me he's not telling a tale there. He's, what he didn't do, this is lying by omission. What he didn't tell them is I was the one that misled him. See, nobody will stand up and say that. A person gets misled and the pastor doesn't stand up and say, oh yeah, that was my fault. Because what I heard from the Lord was different and I lied to them because I wanted to keep them in my church. I didn't want to lose my worship pastor. I'm so glad I don't have to worry about losing our worship pastor. Some of you probably hope that God gets rid of the, youth, the worship pastor, but hey, that's all right. That's, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> oh my gosh, where was I? Oh. He said, it is the man of God who is disobedient to the word of the Lord. Hmm. Therefore, the Lord has delivered him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke. Do you see? That if you don't hear and get the word from the Lord and follow what he tells you, that's on you. That was on that man of God. And he spoke to his son saying, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled it. And then he went and found his corpse thrown on the road and the donkey and the lion standing by the corpse. That still blows my mind. And the lion had not eaten the corpse nor torn the donkey. And the prophet took up the corpse of the man of God, laid it on the donkey, and brought it back. So the old prophet came to the city to mourn and bury him. And then he laid the corpse in his own tomb, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. And so the, the prophecy is fulfilled that he's not going to wind up laying in the tombs of, of his fathers. But here's what's crazy is I, I start to wonder, is there a little bit of guilt and shame in the, in the prophet two, two's heart? I mean... Because now all of a sudden he feels bad and he's like going and getting the guy's body and putting it on a donkey and puts him in his own sepulchre. And he, he winds up telling his sons it, it, further on down, he goes, and you know what, I want you, when I die, I want you to lay me with him. I mean, that's all kinds of crazy. But we don't know. It doesn't say what his heart was in doing that. It doesn't say that he was ashamed. It doesn't say, but it sure kind of would make sense. That something... He, he felt guilty about what he had done. In verses 20, I think it's 20 and 21, we see that the, repu or verse 21, that the rep retribution from the Lord, it's quick. It's quick. And the Lord uses this man of, this prophet who winds up lying 
But I love the fact that the lion, uh, that's my best part. I just think that's awesome that he didn't eat him. Praise Jesus. Oh, Lord. Could you imagine that? Being eaten by a lion. Because I think they start with the stomach. It's the easiest thing to get to. I don't know why I shared that with you, but that's a little, that's a little macabre for a Sunday morning. Y'all awake now? <laughs> so here's the thing. I want to encourage you. Don't let anyone lead you astray. And don't let your own fleshly desires, your own fleshly lusts, your own pride, keep that old man dead. And I keep seeing Christians trying to resuscitate that thing. I'm like, why are you giving it mouth-to-mouth resuscitation? Let it lay. Bury it deeper. I, I've told Christians before, I said, here's what it's like you living out of the, new, the old man while you've been made a new man, right? We're, we're, when we're in Christ, we're made a new creation, right? We're a new man. I said, here's what it's like. In the old days, when, when a man murdered another person, another man or whatever, they would take the corpse, and his punishment was to carry the corpse around his back until the corpse infected his body and he died. That's crazy, right? I said, and that's kind of what it's like for a Christian when you're carrying this old man around with you. Number one, it's, it's ugly. Number two, it stinks. And number three, it's going to kill you. It'll kill you. It'll, it'll rob you blind. It'll rob you of your joy. It'll rob you of your peace. It'll rob you of your comfort. It'll rob you of your boldness. It'll rob you of your courage. It'll rob you from everything. So that's why I tell people, why are you walking around with that dead carcass on your back? Bury that thing deeper if you got to. Now we got to be people that stick with the paths of righteousness of Jesus Christ, the paths of righteousness that God have, has established for us. And why? Because they lead to mercy and truth. The Old Testament, it's filled with great examples like this. Filled with them. I've heard people say, oh, it's not relevant. Bible's not relevant. That's not relevant. Oh, yes, it is. Come on, we just did it today. We found a relevancy about the paths that we take and the way we follow God and what the two directions lead to. The path of righteousness, the path of unrighteousness. They wound up both on paths of unrighteousness. So what's the... What's the answer today? What's the moral of the story? Stay on paths of righteousness. Repent quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. It says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. Praise God for those men, mighty men of faith that wrote these words for us. I don't want you to be unaware that all, and that's the thing, we don't get an excuse because of the word. People say, well, I didn't know. Well, then you better go read it. Well, I don't know. Well, just because I heard, I heard a judge tell me one time, he said, your lack of knowledge of the word does not absolve you, or uh, your lack of knowledge of a law does not absolve you from the law. Boy, that was a huge lesson to me. Because then I realized, man, my lack of understanding, because God gave us his word, it's right there. I have the ability to read it. And it's on me if I don't follow it. It's on me. I can't blame anybody else. No one's going to be standing in heaven on my behalf. Let's keep going. It says, To be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud in the, in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock, <clears throat> which is Jesus, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples. So what's he talking about? All those things. So what does that mean? It means that the Bible is definitely relevant today as much as it was back when it was first, when the actions, right? Because they didn't write the word. They, it didn't get written until after these things happened. Otherwise, they'd have nothing to write about. But they're all examples for us. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. We have an example, but the problem is, is history keeps repeating itself. It says, To the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters, 
as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by the serpents, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. <clears throat> Glory to God. The word of God is for us today. I remember, and there's some people that are too, but when I first got saved, I was scared to death of the Old Testament. I'd read it and go, huh? I just did not understand what it was talking about. But when I started to go understand uh, what the culture was during that day, there's ways to find out the culture, the historical culture of a time, it brought relevance to some of the things. So the thing is, is I couldn't just read it for what it said. I had to dig a little deeper. Heaven forbid, come on, a little bit of work, folks, to get a deeper understanding of what the Word of God is saying. Put a little effort into it. In my final thoughts, I just want to share with you that if you're on the path this morning, on a path other than God's path for your life, I want to encourage you to repent of your sins. I want to ask you to forgive, ask him to forgive you of your sins. But I want you to also invite him to come in and be the Lord of your life. Everybody wants him as a savior, but they're challenged when we say, Lord. And to follow his commands because that's what people do when they love him. And for us as followers of Jesus Christ, these are my encouraging closing words for you. First of all, hear the word of the Lord for yourselves, follow it, and don't deviate from it. Amen? Number two, don't chase after a word from a prophet or someone who in, whose intentions are not aligned with the Lord or his word. Number three, don't allow anyone to come into your life and lead you astray and cause you to deviate from the logos or the rhema word in your life. And at the end of the day, every one of us is going to stand before the Lord our God and we're going to give an account for our lives. And no one's going to be there. You're not going to be able to point your finger at your spouse. You're not going to be able to point your finger at your children. You're not going to be able to point your finger at your pastor. You're not going to be able to point a finger anywhere else. What we all got to realize is when there's a, point, a finger being pointed from our lives, there's three pointing back at us. I know it sounds lame, but it's the truth. Most people that are pointing the fingers at other people have more things against them than what they're pointing out in others. So I think it's time for us to stop pointing today and take personal responsibilities for our own lives and our own relationships with the Lord. And that's my biggest desire, one of my biggest desires besides leading people to Jesus, but for those that I'm discipling. For goodness sake, take personal responsibility for your own relationship with Jesus Christ. And stop blaming everybody else. I didn't have people discipling me, mentoring me, or training me when I came into church. They were all too busy talking about the building that they built and the things that they had done. And we're in charge because we're the patriarchs and the matriarchs. And my name's on a pew. And I was like, P-U. We got to dress a certain way and look a certain way. And you know what? There were men, men of God there that I, that I kind of admired. I, I thought that they were mighty men of God, only to turn out that they were just men who were religious. And I realized at one point that it was my responsibility, not theirs, my responsibility. I remember there was a couple times with Sharon when I was, when I was dating her, well, I guess it was courting her, but she didn't know that God told me that she was going to be my wife, so I let her know that we were dating instead of courting because I didn't want to scare her. But um, where I, would t I told her, I said, look, I can't trust what's coming out of Bible colleges through these pastors. Not that I don't love them and I don't care about them. I love them. They're in my life and I, I respect them. But I'm responsible for what's in this book. I'm responsible for my relationship with God. It's up to me to dig in and find out what's in there. It's up to me to get in there and figure out what his commands to me are. It's up to me to get in there and, and, and resolve my relationship with him and no one else's. 
And that's when it all changed for me. When I wasn't blaming them, those men did not help me. But that is my heart. My heart is to raise up young men and women in the admonition of the Lord. And I pray we get an opportunity to do that with a lot. Amen? I, I, I think it's important for us. And so as I look out at, and, and as people are coming in, what you don't realize is there's, we're up to something. We're raising up people and we're discipling and mentoring other people so they can become disciplers and mentors. If you need to run, run now. Because that's our responsibility before the Lord is to raise pe- the next generation up and not worry about whether we see something now, but prepare it for the future generations and set something up for them. Amen? God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today and we thank you for your word that it's relevant today. And we ask, Father, that you would, <laughs> by your Holy Spirit, cut, cut to the core in us, Lord. Cut to the marrow of the bone in our lives. And Lord, reveal to us the things that you spoke today out of your word. And I, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would touch on those things in each one of our lives, that we would reconcile those things with the Father. We thank you for the group that's here, and we pray, Lord, that your blessings would be upon them. Lord, that they would come into a deeper knowledge and understanding of who you are in their lives and who they are in you. And Lord, we just pray that you would just pour out your spirit upon them this week as they go out into the world and share the good news of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you. We pray for those that are coming. Prepare their hearts, Lord, to receive the fullness of your gospel, training, and discipleship, and mentoring, but also love and to be part of a family that you're building here in this place. 